Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 3 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Moraz, and today we'll be exploring the topic of curiosity and caution as a skeptical starting point, a continuation of our discussion on realistic expectations in the last episode. The feedback I received on the last episode was very reassuring. It showed me that there is definitely an audience out there for the discussion of the human side of skepticism. In fact, listener feedback is what prompted a continuation of today's topic. You wanted to delve a little bit deeper and hear how to apply the goals outlined last time. A discussion of skills and their applications is exactly what this podcast is about, so I'm happy to share more. And I'll include some suggestions that you made along the way. While all of the feedback was positive, there were a few examples of some that are having a hard time with the concept of setting the science aside in order to examine our interactions with non-skeptics. And that's okay. If your brain is hurting a bit, that's a good thing. Exposing ourselves to new ideas and looking at familiar issues in new ways is how we flex and strengthen our critical thinking muscles. We'll jump into the topic of critical thinking in the next episode, and after that, we just might tackle the topic of gender and skepticism. But let's stay focused on today's topic. In the last episode, we discussed the benefits of setting realistic goals and expectations for our interactions with non-skeptics in our daily lives. Goals are necessary to help keep our interactions constructive and focused. Keeping these goals realistic and within our ability to achieve strengthens our relationships, keeps the lines of communication open, so that critical thinking and informed decision-making can actually occur. At the end, I shared my own process and goals with an invitation for you to do the same. For myself, I decided that I would consciously stop trying to create science enthusiasts or consumer watchdogs out of my friends, and I would stop pushing my own conclusions and inadvertently bypassing critical thinking. Instead, I would try to promote a sense of curiosity in the natural world, instill a sense of caution and questionable claims, and assist people in making their own informed decisions. I've been doing this for a while now, and it's made a noticeable change in my interactions with others, not to mention lowering my stress level every time a skeptical clash occurs. Based on listener feedback, I can see that your own process of examining your expectations, goals, and interactions with others has been very diverse. The most common response was how similar the situations I shared were with your own. That's reassuring because it suggests that the solutions I came up with might be useful for you as well. Others went in a completely different direction based on their needs. For some of you, looking at your interactions meant simply creating communication where none currently exists and being more open and honest about your skepticism and related interests. Others felt their current communication was effective but needed to be toned down, less detailed and not so overwhelming. In other cases, goal setting was actually directed towards fellow skeptics in an effort to promote and demonstrate a more civil approach with the public. And one listener was not a skeptic at all, but an alternative health practitioner who found the podcast and decided to share it with a skeptical family member whose aggressive approach was ruining their relationship. Yes, it can flow in the other direction. I do hope they continue listening and are able to work work through those differences and find that common ground. The email that was sent to me left me very encouraged that that could happen. So all of these were wonderful examples of how we can be more effective if we take a moment to examine our interactions and set the appropriate goals. The goals I set for my interactions with non-skeptics were important to me because they represented a starting point. I've always expected others to jump into my world rather than meeting them at their own point on the skeptical spectrum. That isn't a good thing to do when introducing someone to something new. It's intimidating, it's overwhelming, and often shuts down the process of learning. Starting with the basics, in my case the promotion of simple curiosity and caution, is necessary for a constructive learning process. And there are a couple of reasons why, both of which most teachers are aware of and actively address when creating positive learning environments in classrooms. The first thing to be aware of is something called affective filters. In a classroom, as in daily life, a person's emotional state impacts their ability to learn. The range of emotional needs can be quite complex if you care to explore deeply, but for our purposes an intuitive understanding is fine. An affective filter is simply an emotional block which impedes learning. It could be something as basic as hunger, shelter, or safety. If these needs are not met, it's hard for a teacher to get a student to focus on learning. Similarly, fear, intimidation, cultural reluctance, or religious taboos can impede learning as well. You can never eliminate affective filters. 
They're a natural part of our human condition, but we can be aware of them and minimize them as much as possible. So with this in mind, I can look at my family and friends and see that scientific knowledge, research, academia are all intimidating concepts, or that religious differences can cause a great deal of stress in certain discussions. Recognizing these affective filters or emotional obstacles helps us minimize them wherever possible. The other concept to be aware of is what I call cognitive Velcro. It's not an official term, it's just my own. It simply means that people learn best when new knowledge is attached to existing knowledge. That's it. Simple enough. But we often forget this and race people along too quickly in their learning curve. We need to take a moment and see what a person knows already and identify how we can build upon that knowledge gradually. So, being aware of these concepts, building upon existing knowledge, and minimizing emotional barriers will help us in forming constructive starting points with non-skeptics. In fact, they're useful in any situation where we want to promote a positive learning environment. With a little practice, they'll become intuitive and simply blend together with other skills as part of your ability to adapt your communication to the needs of others. In other words, knowing your audience and adapting as appropriate. These are two things in my mind when I formulated my goals to promote curiosity and caution. They don't guarantee learning, not at all. They simply help create the conditions in which it can thrive. So, how do we go about promoting curiosity and caution? I think it goes without saying that the ways in which we can do this are endless and will vary depending on the interests or the nature of the relationships you have with others. What I might choose will be very different from your own choices. I will share some specific examples, but first, let me share some tips I kept in mind in my own process which might be applicable to yours. In order to best promote curiosity and caution among family and friends, I felt that I needed to keep three things in mind. The first thing I needed to do is to self-identify the aspects of my life that I was seeking to share with others. People will be more receptive, or tolerant as the case may be, to information you share if they associate it with who you are as a person. We expect doctors to talk about medicine, physicists to talk about physics, etc. But skepticism doesn't always match our professional identity. So if you're a science enthusiast, but not a scientist, you need to share that. If you're an atheist but remain silent, that needs to be known too. Self-identifying won't produce agreement, but it will let people know what they can expect from you. It makes you an example, and that, in itself, can often be the most powerful influence. Second, people will be most receptive to things you have to share if they associate that information with things they believe are of genuine interest to you. If your quote-unquote thing is simply to promote science, well, that covers a lot of ground. And in terms of sharing information, it can be overwhelming, and some might just tune it out. It really depends on your audience. Pick an area or two of particular interest to you and allow that to be your focus. For me, I love planetary sciences, and I can't get enough of it. Sharing a genuine passion in a focused manner anchors friends and family in a way that feels less like spam and more like an extension of who you are. Seeing you so passionate about something might actually spark their own curiosity, and over time, they may find themselves more knowledgeable about your interests and more curious. Or it just might inspire them to want to delve into their own interests more deeply. Either way, you're sharing your joy of learning, and that itself is contagious. And finally, involve others in your interests. Sometimes the best way to share information is not to say anything at all, but simply involve others in a related activity. Let them experience it on their own. So, in my efforts, I made sure to self-identify, narrow information to genuine interests, and involve others directly whenever possible. So now for some examples. Not necessarily things I do very well, but I'm giving it my best shot and I'm adapting and learning as I go. One of my favorite ways of promoting science is to tap into something my family and friends already know and want to know more about. My six-year-old son. He's at an age where the world of science is wide open and he loves learning about dinosaurs, evolution, planets, the environment, robots, and the list goes on. I found it amazing just how much exposure to science I can provide others simply by sharing with them many of the things that he's learning and is interested in. In fact, sometimes I let him explain the science himself. One of my proudest moments was listening to him explain evolution to an adult. It was really cool to see just how much he understood. But I'm always sure to do this with supervision. Since some friends do have very strong religious beliefs, those can be learning moments too, but I take extra care to make sure they're constructive, positive, and appropriate for my son. So far, so good. 
Also, as a parent, we have the opportunity to visit lots of places, such as museums, observatories, aquariums, science centers, where we can easily invite others to join us. Personally, we're fortunate that we live by the coast, so island trips, whale watching, snorkeling, hiking, kayaking can all be filled with an appreciation for nature and the science behind it without ever saying a word. And you certainly don't need to be a parent to do these things, but in my case, it helps. I also use Facebook to share information but I try to keep it to specific topics. Personally, I found that promoting science via social networks isn't as effective for me, but that's just for me. That's something I prefer to do in person whenever possible. But it is where I share information on consumer protection, pseudoscience, and sometimes atheism. I've made a point to use social media as my means of self-identifying my skepticism, atheism, and commitment to science education and science literacy. This was fairly disruptive at first, but much easier now that it's common knowledge among my friends. Plus, it feels great to be fully out of the skeptical closet. But I do limit my posts to just a handful a week, and I only post things that are the most important to me. I do ruffle feathers sometimes, but even those exchanges and common threads are informative for others. Also, my lecturing has also been significantly minimized. Oh, I can still spat out for hours, just ask my wife, but I'm learning to keep science and skepticism in more bite-sized forms. I'm trying to think more before speaking and identify the core of the information I'd like to share before sharing it. That way, if I get tuned out, they've already got the main point after the first few sentences. So, let's see, what else? I've also stopped the endless arguing I used to get caught up in, in either in person or via social media. My goal is no longer to change a person's mind, but to simply share information which will hopefully inform their decision making. Most people have been openly appreciative of this. But with others, it's a completely lost cause. But even in those situations where I'm poked and prodded to argue, there are usually others watching or reading if online, and a brief and informative debate can actually serve to educate others. Now this is a trick the pros know all too well. You don't think that people like Dawkins or Shermer actually expect to change the mind of the people they're debating, right? Not likely. They're usually there to educate and inform the audience. I like that approach. And with that done, I usually walk away, leaving a positive and informative image for everyone watching. When it comes to consumer protection, alternative medicine, and scams, I try to frame my information in a way that reflects the real concern I have for the well-being of others. Now, this isn't contrived. It's very true. I just haven't always been effective at sharing this concern in the past. I don't want my friends to feel stupid. I just want them to be safe in their choices, and I want them to know that. One interesting thing I've done lately has been to be more honest and open with my own non-skeptical past. For example, I love apocalyptic mythology in its fictional form, but at one point in my life I was much more susceptible to its influence. I share that fact when I reassure people about 2012. I think it's important for others to see that my skepticism was part of a process as well, one that they can make if they choose. I'm not necessarily better at it and I'm just a bit further along. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm sure that's more than enough information. Your goals, expectations, and process will be different. They don't need to be the same. What's important is that we're taking time to look at our interactions with others and adapting them to realistically meet our goals. We should all do this more often and in many areas of our life. Let's wrap things up by pulling back and getting a bit of perspective on the concept of curiosity and caution. It isn't just a concept conducive to daily life or an interpersonal communication trick. It's also a necessity for growth of skepticism and critical thinking. Ask yourself, what defines a skeptic? Is it how knowledgeable you are? How many scientific papers you publish? How many degrees you have? Or how much skeptical knowledge you've collected? By these measures, we'd be excluding vast majorities of our population in favor of a select few. Yet, what about a 10-year-old child who is surrounded by a family of psychics, alternative health practitioners, fairy tales, and pseudoscience, and yet stops thinks and decides to question the validity of what they are told. Is that child a good skeptic? What is it that actually defines skepticism? What do we base our skeptical status and success upon? If we don't answer these questions, others will, and we may not like their conclusions. For me, skepticism is an action. It's a process of questioning and learning which continuously takes us beyond what we currently believe to be true. The moment we break our first toy in order to see how it works, we're behaving skeptically. The moment we question our parents' decisions, we're behaving skeptically. At its most basic level, our natural curiosity of the world and the caution we exercise as we interact with it 
is skepticism. We are skeptics when our curiosity and caution manifest themselves in a desire to learn. When we look at things in this way, it becomes easier to see that we all have the ability to be skeptical. There are no barriers to entry other than the ones we create. And we differ only in the extent to which it's applied in our lives. Skepticism as defined by curiosity and caution is something that everyone is capable of. That is something that even my mother, the most non-skeptical person I know, is capable of being a part of and contributing to. That is the common ground we need to seek, the inclusiveness we need to strive for, and the contributions we should value, encourage, and promote in others. If you have questions, comments, or would like to share your own tips and ideas on living skeptically, send them to actuallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash factually. Thanks for listening. Realistic expectations in the last episode. The feedback I received on the last episode was very reassuring. It showed me that there is definitely an audience out there for the discussion of the human side of skepticism. In fact, listener feedback is what prompted a continuation of today's topic. You wanted to delve a little bit deeper and hear how to apply the goals outlined last time. A discussion of skills and their applications is exactly what this podcast is about, so I'm happy to share more. And I'll include some suggestions that you made along the way. While all of the feedback was positive, the consumer watchdogs out of my friends, and I would stop pushing my own conclusions and inadvertently bypassing critical thinking. Instead, I would try to promote a sense of curiosity in the natural world, instill a sense of caution and questionable claims, and assist people in making their own informed decisions. I've been doing this for a while now, and it's made a noticeable change in my interactions with others, not to mention lowering my stress level every time a skeptical clash occurs. Based on listener feedback, I can see that your own process, there were a few examples of some that are having a hard time with the concept of setting the science aside in order to examine our interactions with non-skeptics, and that's okay. If your brain is hurting a bit, that's a good thing. Exposing ourselves to new ideas and looking at familiar issues in new ways is how we flex and strengthen our critical thinking muscles. We'll jump into the topic of critical thinking in the next episode, and after that, we just might tackle the topic of gender and skepticism. But let's stay focused on today's topic. In the last episode, we discussed the benefits of setting realistic goals and expectations for our interactions with non-skeptics in our daily lives. Goals are necessary to help keep our interactions constructive and focused. Keeping these goals realistic and within our ability to achieve strengthens our relationships, keeps the lines of communication open so that critical thinking and informed decision making can actually occur. At the end, I shared my own process and goals with an invitation for you to do the same. For myself, I decided that I would consciously stop trying to create science enthusiasts or want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode three of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Moraz, and today we'll be exploring the topic of curiosity and caution as a skeptical starting point, a continuation of our discussion on 